I think that a lot of the pain that the Bitcoin community has absorbed is because of the slow response of the regulators. The world's full of people that don't understand the theory of money. Michael Saylor is the largest holder of Bitcoin in the world, and as a result, has become the face of Bitcoin. In this highlight, Michael Saylor finally reveals how the FTX crash will change the future course of Bitcoin and his frustrations with the crypto community. A lot of Bitcoiners were sounding the alarm about these tokens and exchanges. So where did we fall short and why couldn't we prevent this? I think that Bitcoiners have, have, uh, have had a very clear vision, and that's because they move forward in a principled fashion. And, and uh, if you didn't uh, buy the altcoins, if you didn't put your money in uh, a crypto exchange, then you didn't fall short. You did the best you could do for yourself, for your family, for your friends, for your followers. There's been an, a never-ending campaign by Bitcoiners to convince people not to trust run your own node, take responsibility for your own actions, hold your own keys, support an ethical, decentralized, fair, transparent protocol. And I would say that we've, uh, you know, we can look at it as, well, we failed because we didn't convince everybody in the crypto world to adopt mm -hmm. Bitcoin, but you can also look at it as we succeeded because we, had, we got the most number of people mm -hmm. and the most amount of money to adopt Bitcoin. Is that crypto ecosystem holding Bitcoin back or is it gonna ultimately help Bitcoin adoption? I think that, the, that there are some ideas in the crypto ecosystem which are good ideas that have been uh, poorly executed or executed in an immature fashion uh, that has been counterproductive. So let's, let's talk about the good ideas. The good idea is a digital commodity that is an asset without an issuer. Bitcoin is the greatest execution of the idea of a digital commodity because it is not just a commodity, it's a scarcity. It's an asset without an issuer that's absolutely capped. The second, and it has a role, right, as a long-term store of value or as a base layer for the digital economy or the entire world economy in the future. There's a second good idea. A digital currency, like the dollar, that can move on an Android phone or an iPhone at the speed of light between 8 billion people in order to allow cross-border payments, cross-border remittances, purchases, and the like, and to give, uh, give an entitlement or access to the dollar mm -hmm. to people in Argentina or Cuba or North Korea or Nigeria. So uh, a digital exchange works 168 hours a week Right, uh, and, uh, and that's nearly five times as much as banking hours. So the idea that you can, uh, you can get the bank to work for you all the time is a big idea. Also, the idea that I could have a digital exchange on my Android phone or my iPhone in my pocket as I travel through Central Africa is also an empowering idea. And finally, you know, a, a fourth idea is just property rights. Mm -hmm. If you own Apple stock, a bunch of it, your bank is able to loan that Apple stock out and get a yield on it, but just not for you. You don't, right? So a million dollars of assets sitting in a conventional bank is the bank's, uh, it's the bank's assets and they get benefits from it, but you don't get benefits from it. So the 20th century conventional banking system is constructed to work part-time for its own benefit. And the idea of a digital exchange would be, you ought to be able to hold your own assets, get the yield on your own assets, trade your and transfer your own assets whenever you want, and do it at the speed of light, and do it a thousand times faster and quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, another innovation. The last innovation is a digital token. Um, it, 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 it you know, exploded as NFTs in the crypto world. Uh, so Bitcoin is economically sound because it's, it's capped scarcity is technically sound because it's layered from the base layer, which is optimized for security, to the layer two, which is optimized for performance and scalability, and enables layer three applications. And I, I think that as we look forward, what we'll say is, well, the first decade of crypto, they were trying to do all these good ideas, but they were doing them with unregistered securities and centralized banks and centralized exchange and, and, those th and with 
poor economic principles, right? And they collapsed under, they either collapsed because they're unethical and the regulators shut them down, or they collapsed because they're technically flawed, mm -hmm. right? And they clog up uh, and they're trying to do everything on the base layer, or they collapsed because they're economically unsound. Mm -hmm. The next generation of the digital economy, digital assets, pe people will pursue digital exchanges, digital currency, digital commodities, digital tokens, digital securities, they will pursue them, but in uh, an ethically sound, technically sound, economically sound fashion. There are now even bigger reasons for regulators to come in and intervene, look at the space with a microscope. So are you concerned at all that given this environment of volatility with crypto platforms blowing up, that this will negatively impact Bitcoin's adoption with regulators? I'm not concerned. In fact, I think that uh, a lot of uh, the pain that the Bitcoin community has absorbed is because of the slow response of the regulators. If the regulators had moved faster, in, in order to, uh, if they had moved more aggressively in 2018 or 2019, you wouldn't have seen all of these, you know, crypto casinos spin up the way they've spun up. One of two things will happen with regulators. They will either move much more aggressively in a fairly regressive, conservative approach, and that means they'll just shut down all the other crypto innovations, in which case Bitcoin will still be a beneficiary. Because in a conservative world, Bitcoin is the apex crypto property and the apex crypto asset, and people will simply hold it as a long-term store of value. And if, if the regulators said everything in the crypto ecosystem is now you know, forbidden, all you can do is buy Bitcoin and hold it and sell it at, you know, at the end of its useful life, treat it like gold, <laughs> Bitcoin would still benefit. Mm -hmm. Right. The other uh, the other extreme would be the regulators act proactively. Uh, they act progressively and they provide a uh, a path to registration of a digital commodity, a path to registration of a digital security, a path to registration of a digital token, mm -hmm. a path to registration of a digital exchange and um, and uh, a path to registration of a digital currency. Right? And if they said, you want to issue Tether, you have to file monthly statements, register with this you know, banking supervisor, and, and take on these responsibilities to have these reserves and uh, uh, abide by these guardrails, you can issue a stable coin. Mm -hmm. If they said that, if they said, okay, well, you want to issue a digital security, you have to do it this way, you know, fill out these forms and every month or every week or every quarter, you know, this is what you do. I'm just curious from your own experience, you know, what lessons can you share from all of your experience with risk management? Well, I think one of the lessons is you have to separate your P&L from your balance sheet. So if the way that you're making money is, is and Ross's letter, he points out that, that they make money with 10 different strategies. One of them is Bitcoin. The other nine strategies are firmly grounded in the conventional economy of the world. So if you're a doctor, you stay a doctor. You're the best doctor you can be. You serve your patients the best and you maximize your, your income as a doctor. And then on your balance sheet, you, you have assets and on your balance sheet, you would have a variety of assets. Whatever property you're gonna hold for a long period of time, you could have a diversified portfolio of property of, of digital property like Bitcoin and you might very well hold <clears throat> real estate and you might own a share in a company, right? Is there anything that keeps you up at night? I think we need a lot, we need to educate a lot more people. What keeps me up at night is that there are so many mainstream influencers, so many policy makers, so many, uh, so many investors and money managers that still don't understand half an hour or an hour worth of Bitcoin fundamentals. But the world is still full of uh, incredible numbers of people at every level from the top ranks of our government to leaders, captains of industry, down to rank and file. The world's full of people that don't understand the theory of money. The world is full of people that don't understand the power of an open, permissionless monetary network. 
right? The fact that you can move a million dollars from here to Africa and you could do it in an open rail and then you could, you could do it a million times cheaper than the conventional 20th century banking system and you could do it a million times better and then you could program it a million times faster. So most people, they don't realize that money is technology. They don't realize, they don't really understand what, what true a non-defective money is because every monetary system in the history of the world has collapsed and every money that's ever been invented before Bitcoin was objectively defective mathematically and physically. And so because people don't have that fundamental understanding of the physics of money, and they don't understand that money is technology, they're not looking for the solution. They have this massive blind spot. Watch this video that blew up the internet where Michael Saylor reveals, in the best speech I've ever heard on Bitcoin, why Bitcoin is still so undervalued, how Bitcoin will skyrocket to new all-time highs, and why Bitcoin is the best chance we have to defeat tyranny. 